Cavs Nation. I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. It's just me today. It's another solo dolo episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast, and I'm happy to bring you all the insight I got going on. But before we get into the games ahead, you know, if you listen to our last podcast, Chris and I discussed the postseason potentials and what the brackets are looking like. And I noticed that the Lakers and Warriors are currently in the play-in mix at the 9 and 10 seeds, respectively. And I couldn't find the last time both these teams had missed the playoffs, and I wanted to give an update before I got into anything else. The last time both these teams were not in the playoffs was the 2004 2005 season that's like 20 years ago that's insane to think about how much the game has been impacted by these two franchises and obviously Stephen Curry has a large part of that for the Warriors being drafted in 2009 with the seventh overall pick and LeBron I mean it's LeBron James He has been with the Lakers since the 2018-2019 season, and it doesn't need to be mentioned his longevity in the league after being drafted first overall in 2003. But enough about players not related to the Cavs. I want to talk a little bit about the last game the Cavs played because we didn't mention some key points in the last podcast, and I want to give you a mini preview of their next game. Let's lock in. The Cavs made franchise history against the Pelicans. Sam Merrill and Karis LeVert became the first duo in Cavs history to record nine or more assists off the bench in a single game. They both finished the game with nine assists. And yes, this is mentioning regular and postseason. It was also the first time in Cavs history that three players finished with nine or more assists in a game, adding Darius Garland to that mix, who finished with a game-high 11 assists. The passing clinic resulted in the Cavs' season-high 38 assists in a game, and they assisted on all but nine made baskets in the win over the Pelicans. I wrote a story for Cleveland.com about how Karis LeVert has stepped his passing game up, especially when his shots aren't falling. And Wednesday's game was another example of that. He was just one of six from the field in 30 minutes played, but finished with nine assists and the second highest team plus or minus with plus 27, only coming second to Sam Merrill who had a career-high 9 assists, as I mentioned earlier, and was back to his old sharpshooting self, knocking down 5 tray balls for 15 points in 28 minutes. And while the Pelicans were seen complaining about calls, and even talking about it in a post-game press conference, there were instances where they tried to punk the Cavs, like when Valanchunas put his shoulder into Jarrett, knocking him to the floor. But it didn't work as they had hoped because Jared Allen just kept showing up for business as usual as he has done on a consistent basis. And I think that's an area he's grown since last year's first round exit. He's just taking whatever happens as it is and continuing to do his job and show up regardless of what happened the previous possession, the previous day, the previous play. It doesn't matter. Jared Allen has shown up and is going to continue to show up for the Cavs. He has played in every single game since missing the first five games of the regular season due to his bone bruise that we remember from preseason. And obviously, with how the Cavs are set up right now, without Evan Mobley and Max Strus and don't know when they're going to come back, the Cavs will need that to continue. And what better way for that to continue than in their next game? The Cavs got the Rockies coming up next on the schedule on Saturday. And we all know there's some history there, at least between two players, Dylan Brooks and Donovan Mitchell. And obviously it's great for the Cavs to have Donovan Mitchell back in this game because, you know, Dylan Brooks could try and pull a couple things or two, but Donovan Mitchell 
is going to be able to assert his presence. And like Chris wrote about in an article that came out today, the Donovan Mitchell effect is real. And we saw that in the last game against the Pelicans, even though he wasn't getting his shots to go down as he would like, his presence was able to affect how the other Cavs players were able to impact the game. And that's a big thing. It's what comes with being the guy on any given team. And I want to talk about being the guy on a team. That, for the Houston Rockets, might be Dylan Brooks. It might be Fred Van Vliet. Or it could be Jalen Green on any given night. But let's talk about Dylan Brooks for a second. Because he's claimed himself as a villain. And I know I've said I'm a villain stan at times. But not in this case. My thing is that if you're a villain that adds to the plot or your reasoning to being a villain makes sense or something of that nature, then sure. But Dylan Brooks has shown that without a surrounding team like he had in Memphis with John Morant and the Grizzlies, his villain antics don't amount to a whole lot, especially with the mind games. The Rockets are 11th in the West, and they shouldn't be competition for the Cavs, but they will try to test them mentally, especially with Sengun being out. I take this game as one that Jared Allen can impose his will and attack the basket. The Cavs have utilized their strategy of working inside out, which they developed when Darius Garland and Evan Mobley first went out, and that allowed them to create more three-point perimeter shooting and also use Jared Allen as an offensive hub. And in the game against the Rockets, I don't see a reason why Jared Allen doesn't touch the ball every possession down the court for the Cavs. You can always use him as an offensive hub, as we've learned he is capable of doing, and his passing game has also improved over the season. And he should be able to continue to create when doubled. But in my eyes, there isn't a player on the Rockets roster that should be able to compete with Jarrett in the paint. Sure, Jock Landale and Jabari Smith Jr. match him in height, but their skill set, I don't think, is to the level of Jarrett. And if they try to switch Dylan Brooks onto him, <laughs> I need Jarrett to put Dylan in the rim because that's a major mismatch. There is no reason that Jarrett Allen should see Dylan Brooks in the paint and not simply attack. Obviously, he is a great guy, an unselfish player, and what makes him so integral to this Cavs team. But if he gets Dylan Brooks in the paint, he should simply go to the rack. And I think that's got to be his mindset for the entire Houston game. Obviously, Sangoon was a huge part for them, and losing him is huge for the Rockets. The other key point to make about this Houston Rockets game is Tristan Thompson is coming back. And after his 33rd birthday, we got to see how giddy he was to get back onto the court. He's been practicing with the team since his suspension started. He's been able to be around the team. I mean, we talk about Alfred Sangoon being out and how Jared Allen needs to be able to attack that defense of the Houston Rockets. Well, this might be the perfect welcome back game for Tristan Thompson. Someone who needs to obviously reacclimate, even though he's not being given the same kind of ramp up period as someone who's coming back from an injury. But there's still going to be a cardio aspect that he's continuing to get back into shape with. Obviously, he's been doing whatever he could at practice, but there's no simulation of that like a regular NBA game. And Tristan Thompson, we know, imposes his will in almost every facet of a basketball game. So if Jared Allen is not going to do that, maybe the Cavs go ahead and put Tristan Thompson in to get some added reps, especially because we've seen recently that J.B. Bickerstaff has not been afraid to use the lineup with Damian Jones and Jared Allen in the same lineup. That's something that is interesting because we obviously know that Evan Mobley and Jared Allen play together. And I'm interested to see if J.B. Bickerstaff goes with a lineup that could potentially have Tristan Thompson 
and Jared Allen in the same lineup to simply go crazy in the paint with just Jabari Smith Jr. in the paint. I don't know if JV Bickerstaff would do that because of having Damian still be a four or Tristan Thompson having five minutes and things of that nature. We'll have to see what rotation he goes with, but I just like thinking of the idea that Tristan Thompson and Jared Allen could be in the paint together, giving the opposing Houston Rockets team that's down one of their most important players and someone who has been doing his thing in the entire league this year in Alpharin Sangoon and just attacking their paint. Obviously, it's a big blow for the Houston Rockets, and we never want to see injuries happen to anybody in the league, no matter of the circumstance. But as I've said before, the Cavs need to take advantage of the situation presented to them. Just like any team has done when they face an Evan mobley list Cavs team or a Donovan mitchell list Cavs team or a Max struess list Cavs team or a Dean wade list Cavs team. We've seen it all year with players and teams going at the Cavs' weaknesses when they've had injured players. I think this is an opportunity for the Cavs to do that back to the Houston Rockets. And that's going to be the case in the playoffs, and that's going to be the case on Saturday night against the Rockets. But we know it's an 82-game season, and the Cavs have proven themselves not to be pushovers. I think the Cavs have grown into the team that their fans have wanted them to be, regardless of the matchup or however many men they were down. They've gone into battle night in and night out, proving people wrong on countless occasions. When the Cavs lost Darius Garland and Evan Mobley, it was said that the season was over when the Cavs didn't have Donovan Mitchell, Max Struess, Dean Wade, Evan Mobley. For multiple games, it was supposed to be a wrap. But this Cavs team has taken some of the hardest hitters, best punches, and kept moving, or swung back and landed a haymaker. To me, it feels like the mindset of this team is no matter who we got or what obstacle is in front of us, we're going to ball. A matchup I look forward to is Jalen Green and whoever he gets matched up with because he's shown to be an offensive problem. He dropped 37 against the Wizards on Thursday, and sure, it was the Wizards, but he showcased his skills. I don't know if the Cavs are going to put Isaac Okoro on him because obviously the Houston Rockets have Fred Van Fleet, who can always be a problem. But we've also seen Karis LeVert step up in that defensive role. And honestly, all of the Cavs have stepped up in a defensive role with Dean Wade being away from the team. And that's something that we need to see continue because we know what the backbone of this Cavs team is. As good as They've been offensively, they always rely on their defense whenever they get into a pinch. And I want to get more into the situation with Jalen Green and how it pertains to a bigger point when it comes to the NBA. But before then, I think we should take a break. When I come back, I'm going to talk about the state of the NBA and how players are coming into a league at such a young age and there's different expectations based on the team that they land with and who they have in front of them. But before then, become a Cavs insider and interact with me and Chris by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from Chris and me. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. I believe that the opportunity that players are brought into can influence how they're going to pan out in the NBA, especially with how young these players are coming in. You get the G League Ignite, Because players are available to come into the NBA at 19 years old. Obviously, that has prevented players from coming straight from high school like some players used to, like Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, and others. But they're still coming at 19 years old after being one and done in college and not having a whole lot of experience. And I'm not even just talking about game experience. I'm talking about their body 
not being adjusted to those things. We talked to Craig Porter Jr. earlier this week about playing in his first NBA season. And even though he is an older player coming into the league after playing five years in college, his body still needed to adjust to playing in the NBA and playing an NBA season. He mentioned that you have back-to-back games. You have games and then a day in between, and then another game, and all the time that you have in between is a travel day. That is wear and tear on the body, and it's hard to accumulate that time schedule with your body at 19 years old because it's still learning. It's still adjusting, and sometimes it's just simply not ready for those things. An example is that Slam turns 30 this year, so they're documenting the 30 players who have helped them become who they are. And it reminded me of players like Jalen Green, Josh Christopher, and Sharif Cooper, who were magazine cover players and top players coming out of high school. And although these young stars were touted as some of the best players, they have vastly different stories in the NBA and also how they got there. Obviously, Jalen Green took the G League Ignite route and has basically been a starter on a subpar Houston Rockets team since he entered the league. Josh Christopher went to Arizona State. It was on the same team as Jalen when he was drafted with similar skills and wasn't seen as a necessity for the Rockets with Green around. And the Rockets decided to let him go. He's now bounced around the G League trying to get his footing. And Sharif Cooper, who was at Auburn, although only having the opportunity to play in a few games, is an extremely talented point guard, and some believe he could be an NBA point guard right now. But he's stuck in the Cavs G League system with the Cleveland Charge, with at least four point guards ahead of him in the pecking order because of where he landed. Also, he started his career in Atlanta behind Trey Young. There was minimal chance that he was getting playing time there anytime soon. And with DeJounte Murray coming over there, that likelihood got even slimmer. And his size doesn't help the scenario in a league that's continuing to grow in size at the point guard position. Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland are considered undersized guards, and Sharif is shorter than them. Then you have players that are drafted extremely young and simply need game experience at the highest level and with the best coaches and trainers to simply reach their potential. And yes, I'm talking about Imani Bates, who simply isn't ready for the NBA stage yet as an all-around player. But his scoring ability is something that few have seen before. You can't take that away from him. But the ability to be coachable, get in the weight room, and put on some size, and then continue to grow his game defensively will make him a valuable asset to the Cavs, in my opinion, in the future, if he sticks with it. He's just 20 years old. There's no need to rush him, or for fans, I'm saying this for you guys, there's no need to rush for him to get minutes, especially with him already on a two-way contract when he's able to be around a playoff contending team in his first season. And let's be honest, this is the best Cavs team, Cavs roster, since LeBron James left. The opportunity to be around the Cavs and how they operate on a daily basis shouldn't be overlooked for his development. Because as I've mentioned multiple times this podcast, it's not just physical, but mental too. And sometimes you need to develop in one area more than the other. And sometimes it's both. And I think Imani Bates could benefit from maturing in both areas. And I've liked being around Imani. I've liked being around his play style, his energy, and you just see how vibrant he is as a person. So this is not taking anything away from how he interacts with the media, how he is as a person or anything like that. I don't want the fans to get the idea that just because he has scoring ability, automatically equates to he's ready for an NBA stage. There's a lot of things that go into it, and maybe me and Chris can go into it even further on a different podcast. But I feel like we've touched on a good amount today. So 
With all that being said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.